I want to be forever young. Do you really want to live forever? One life, forever, one love, and ever, one soul. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gennady Stolyarov II. I'm the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, and I'm pleased to be here today with Dr. Bill Andrews at Sierra Sciences in Reno. Uh, Dr. Andrews, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Yes, well, I'm glad to be part of this. I'm, I'm as Gennady just said, I'm Bill Andrews. I, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Sierra Sciences that is totally focused on trying to find cure for aging and health and we want to be healthy too but it, it's our focus is more on trying to extend telomeres as a means to uh, extend lifespan and health span at least we think that's one of the things that has to be done to do that mm -hmm. so we were both at radfest just last week and mm -hmm. you gave a presentation on telomere biology as well as some of your most recent endeavors. Uh, what are uh, some of the highlights of that presentation? Well, actually, I, I barely scratched the surface because I only had like 20 minutes to talk, and I ended up finding that I still ran out of time there. But I, I guess got to say, it's I, I like the format. I, I thought it, I, I, I thought, you know, I thought I'd give a good talk. My my talk talked at least about the basics of what I've been doing, but I could have talked so much more. But I just, I'm, I'm just a super fan of the Red Fest concept and I was surprised it's like every major leader in anti-aging and transhumanists and robotics and all this kind of stuff were there and um, <laughs> the other thing I like about Red Fest is that uh, there's no charlatans there like at a lot of other kind of conferences this is if you know I, I think this is I I like being there because I like being with like-minded people like you and others that were speaking there but I also like the fact that there's, there's, uh, you, there's so much to learn. And so even I learn stuff listening to speakers, and, and I think anybody could be going to the Rad Fest and learning everything they can do about extending their lifespan and health span as long as possible. But you, get, you talk too. Yes, yeah, I did. Yeah, that, I, I did. I, you were a great talk. And so, uh, but uh, in fact, one important highlight of your talk that you should mention right now is that Yes, so the U.S. Transhumanist Party concluded its presidential primary elections, and I gave an overview of the process, <coughs> the ranked preference voting, how it was conducted, as well as the results. I introduced the winning candidate, Yohanan Ben Zion, who gave his official acceptance speech at Radfest. Yeah. Well, sorry, my, my dog is here today, too. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I talked about my dog at Yes, Rad indeed. Fest, uh, he was there, uh, featured yeah. on the slides. Come here, Dash. Yeah, Dash, come, come here. Come here, Dash. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab come him. Yeah, yeah, come, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here oh, he there is. he is. Yeah, this is Dash. He's, he's uh, uh, the reason behind the naming of a product that we are thinking of developing called uh, Tilo Dash. Uh, dogs end up being an animal that age by telomere shortening just like humans so do cats and dogs or do uh, cats and horses uh, pigs sheep and deer also but cats dogs and horses are the key ones and so uh, we're actually thinking of developing one of our uh, telomere lengtheners called a telomerase inducer into a uh, like salt shaker mm -hmm. and uh, uh, sprinkle it on cat food dog food horse feed and so it's called Tilo Dash, yeah, and uh, uh, so Dash has a, a dual meaning there. One is his <laughs> name, and one is a, a dash of salt, or a dash of, of uh, telomere inducer. Okay, Dash, you're going to have to get yeah. down here. So and <laughs> Dash can indeed dash. He's an ultramarathon dog. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> big time. I will go running 25 miles with him, but he runs back and forth, back and forth all the time. That mm -hmm. He does in, he's in a, d does more than 50 miles. And a dog of his breeding, he's got a mini Labrador. He's running all around here because he's full grab of energy. Grab him real quick, and then <laughs> I'll just hold him so you guys can do the interview. Yeah. Come grab here, him, Dash. Come here. Quick. Dash. No. Dash. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to play. He doesn't want to be. Come here, Dash. Come here. Come here. He knows. Okay, Dash, come here. <laughs> so oh, he'll be running with here. us tomorrow okay. morning. Yes. We are going. So me the three and of us are going to run. Yes, the three of us are going to go for a run tomorrow on a trail I've never been on called the Clear Creek Trail. It starts at Spooner Summit, which is by Lake Tahoe. 
-hmm. And we're going to run to, uh, uh, what's the best way to describe that place? It's uh, like the road to the golf course. Mm -hmm. it's, right. But it's, uh, it's a beautiful trail I've heard about, and we're going to go, all three of us try it tomorrow morning. But 10 miles, I think, of running. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And I feel ready for it. I ran a marathon yeah, yesterday. Say, <laughs> yeah, you had a whole day off, so that's, that's, <laughs> that's probably plenty of time. Uh, so it's interesting, we've discussed this before, uh, when somebody is a habitual runner, the body recovers more quickly from the strain of running. And you also don't get inflammation. I think that's one of the best things about, the, uh, if, if you run in a certain way, running is the best thing you can do for you, or any kind of endurance, right? It could be kayaking, biking, whatever, but uh, if you do it in a way where you do it all the time and you always keep it fun, you never push yourself, it's actually very beneficial. It's going to extend your lifespan and health span. So I'm, I'm glad we both believe in that, and, and we that's the attitude we take. But of course, you kick my butt at every race we run together. <laughs> <laughs> and But tomorrow I know you'll be going at the same pace because yes, you, you're more into having the fun than the, the speed. Absolutely. And it's a beautiful setting with a lot of great scenery to observe. Actually, one of my habits is what I would call photo running, where I would take pictures yeah, of the surrounding landscape. And it also helps cement the run in my memory. I can look back at the pictures and recall how it felt. I noticed on your marathon yesterday, you, you took some like 35 pictures. Yes, I did. <laughs> I was thinking, Wow, he, look at the time you had. What time could it have been if you had st hadn't stopped to take the pictures? <laughs> I mean, so, but that's that's the priority. I always say, you know, you know, if it quits being fun, quit. Go out, do those runs, but don't be worried about going as fast as you can. Stop and take pictures. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea, and I love listening, looking at your pictures. You always get great pictures at your races. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Well, we live in one of the most beautiful areas for running. Yeah. So uh, speaking of running and our friend Dash here, I think you hosted perhaps the first panel in the world on pet longevity at Radfest. Yes. And that, uh, that is, was really fun. It was more fun than giving my regular talk on treating humans. And I was very pleasantly surprised that to see that everybody on the panel, when they got up, the first thing they did is they showed their pets mm -hmm. because we're all in this for our pets. We're, it's like animals, <laughs> a lot of people do animal studies just to come up with treatments for humans, but we're gonna be doing animal studies for the animals. So in our, in, when we start studying animals and trying to extend their lifespan and health span, uh, there's not gonna be any like uh, sacrificing animals mm -hmm. to measure the size of their brain and stuff like that. If it's not beneficial to the animal, or potentially beneficial to the animal <coughs> itself. Uh, it's just I don't I don't believe there's any point in doing. It. I'm actually quite opposed to animal studies, but I, shoot, but I recognize they have to be done. And I'm glad that other people are doing them because I personally don't want serious scientists to ever be doing uh, animal studies where animals have to be sacrificed or harmed in any way during the study. Yes. I believe there should be a humane protocol for experimental animals where if they survive the experiment, they don't just get euthanized. Yeah, that's another thing. It's like I, a lot of times they treat all these animals, the animals are fine, and then they're not allowed to release these animals outside, and they euthanize them all. And it's like I think a horrible, horrible thing. But my, our benefit, and same with everybody on the panel, is to do things that are going to be great for our pets. Our pets, pets are, and actually, <laughs> Surprisingly, humans already spend mm -hmm. more money on, tr on their pet's health than they do on their own health. They're more likely to take a pet to the vet than they are to take themselves to a doctor. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a good thing. So I think I'm looking forward to actually getting pet products. This was our first year. I think we're going to have a, a lot of additional panel people on the uh, list next year, including like George Church's group and uh, uh, some other people I, whose names I've suddenly gone blank on, but I shouldn't have gone blank on them. But we'll get them all there because we didn't have enough notice to actually, they, were already, they weren't available for this year. But I think it's going to be a real popular event at RadFest in the future. Now, do you think that pursuits in the area of pet longevity might actually motivate people to become more <coughs> interested in human longevity? Uh, yeah, it's not my motivation. That's not mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm after. But 
Uh, you know, as soon as we start seeing that pets start living longer and healthier and happier, and uh, and when when we also start doing uh, uh, transhumanism, or I guess we call it transdogisms, uh, <laughs> transcanonism, <-canism>. yeah. <laughs> uh, when we start doing that, people and they, we start the people start seeing the benefit to their pets. They're going to want to do it themselves too. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, uh, yeah. I think the uh, future of our pets are just as bright as the future of, of us. Yes, and hopefully some of the regulatory barriers to experimentation may be a bit lower yeah. with pets. They are, and um, we are actually, you know, to, to we are doing, we're talking about doing some studies mm -hmm. of animals that would be pets uh, that would probably benefit humans a lot more than dogs, cats, and horses would. Uh, there's, um, and that, these are primates. Mm -hmm. Primate, there's, primates are pretty big, so which makes them pretty difficult to do research on because it's very expensive to treat. Yet the more, the larger an animal is, the more drug or therapy you have to use. But we are working with a, uh, hopefully soon, with a, a primate called uh, Madame Bertha's mouse lemur that's only found in Madagascar. And I've been in contact with officials in Madagascar saying that you know, I'd like to do the study, but I would prefer to do the study on people's pets. So, mm -hmm. so if, if somebody has a pet um, lemur that actually lives in their house or something like that, um, I'd like to go to their house, treat the pet, <coughs> and then have the uh, uh, owners just treat the pet normally, and then we just see, you know, what health benefits did it provide. And unfortunately, there will have to be a negative control, but as soon as we start seeing mm -hmm. uh, that the treated pets start getting uh, better or healthier, then the placebo controls will uh, also get treatment and stuff. So it, it'll be an expensive experiment, but it, it would be a lot cheaper than doing the same experiment on humans. And I think that when we get those results, it's gonna also encourage humans to uh, start benefiting from these too. And, and people, I, I understand why people don't wanna do it yet because Quacks and charlatans have been mm -hmm. discrediting the whole field of anti-aging for thousands of years. Uh, people just are a little gun shy. They're, they're, they're not believing that we actually might have something that could work right now. Yes, it's interesting to recall that the quacks and charlatans in this field came first, and the legitimate yeah. science is a lot more <laughs> recent. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I can't believe that any of those past people actually thought they were legitimate because there was really nothing back then. But now we do understand aging extremely well. We don't know if it's going to require just one thing or a multitude of things and stuff. But, you know, I, I just, I'm very impressed with all the people uh, that are working seriously on anti-aging. And they were all at RADFest, as I mentioned. And I just feel like they're all colleagues mm -hmm. because they're all working to cure my aging, you know, and I'm working to cure my aging and their aging. So it's a, it's a, a really great effort that's going on, and, and Bradfest is at the center of it all. Do you think that over the past 10 years, the public's understanding of aging as a condition that could potentially be cured or reversed has improved at all? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, no question about it. <laughs> it's when I first started uh, public, you know, publicly speaking about the research I'm doing, and I would use the expression that I'm trying to cure aging, people would go, oh, that doesn't make sense. That's a concept that we can't even Im uh, imagine because aging is not a disease. It's just something that happens. How can you cure something that's not a disease? And that was a real frustrating thing for me because I had to, because, you know, somehow 50 years ago when my father, or maybe even 55 years ago when my father first put the seed in my head, that uh, when I grow up I should become a doctor and uh, cure aging. He used that term, cure mm -hmm. aging. He thought of it as a disease. He didn't know why nobody has cured it yet. Um, but So I grew up thinking it was a disease and it was only in, uh, probably around 2008, 2009 where I actually really got out on the stage and started speaking publicly about the research that I've been working on for already over 10 years. Um, <coughs> I started calling it cure for aging, I started calling it a disease, and everybody's like, what? That makes no sense. And, and, but now it makes sense. Now mm -hmm. everybody, I'm, I'm surprised at RADFest, how many people got on stage and called it the cure for aging that they're mm -hmm. working on? And that, that's, that's a good turnaround, because 
even just, just because everybody has it doesn't make it not a disease. And when we do cure it, everybody will call it a disease. It's, that's, yes. so I'm looking forward to that. Yes. So, of course, Curing Aging is the title of one of your books yeah. aimed at a lay audience where you explain the mechanisms of telomere shortening and what telomerase might do to reverse that. What would you say uh, for members of the general public are the most effective ways today to slow down the rate of telomere shortening? Uh, well, yeah, uh, the number one cause, and I think every anti-aging doctor, uh, scientist believes this, the number one cause of accelerated aging is uh, inflammation. So decreasing the rate of inflammation is the number one most important thing to do. Now, a lot of people, you know, I say that, and then a lot of people say, yeah, but running causes inflammation. But running doesn't cause inflammation unless you're one of these people that push yourself really hard and cross finish lines on your hands and knees, throwing up. I mean, when you, when you run and just en enjoy yourself, socialize, talk, stop and take pictures, that is the exact opposite. That, I think, people, are, like if you use telomere length as a measure of, of aging and, and overall health, it's been found over and over again that runners that do run in this like more relaxed state actually have longer telomeres than their friends their same age that don't run mm -hmm. and their same their friends the same age that just push themselves really hard so i think i think it's it's keep it fun mm -hmm. if it quits being fun quit save it for another day and and that's one of the best ways to induce reduce inflammation but also believe meditation and yoga are extreme well meditation and yoga are really the same thing but I I believe that those are things that we all have to do to decrease the rate of our telomere shortening keep them as long as possible especially a type of yoga called yin yoga okay uh, yin comes from the yin and yang but yin is kind of like the more relaxed more meditative type yoga where you actually get your body to, to relax and you do kind of stretches and stuff like that, that the stretches last for five minutes and you don't push the stretch really hard, you just find out that your body just gives way. Okay, so this kind I, I do yin yoga several times a week. I do regular yoga several times a week, so I think that's good too. Uh, and I highly recommend that. But there, there's still other things. There's, there's you know, uh, diet. There's some people are sensitive to certain foods. In fact, a lot of people are sensitive to some foods like uh, meats and fish and fowl and dairy. All of those are contain like arachidonic acid, which is a very inflammatory thing. Uh, so cutting those out of your diet, uh, so becoming vegan is actually one of the best things you can do, I think, to extend your lifespan and health span. Um, but uh, it turns out, and this is <laughs> far from, you know, p most people don't realize this, but because there's so much hearsay to the contrary, that oils, oils are one of the most inflammatory things you can do. Not all oils, but most oils, and that includes the big ones like olive oil, canola oil, sesame seed oil, uh, uh, on and on, safflower oil. They are very actually very inflammatory. They're the most calorie concentrated food on the planet, okay? And people, the hearsay is oil is good for you, but it's actually not, so I, you know, reduce oil, and, and I'm a big follower of Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, okay? Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn has written a really great book on decreasing inflammation. It's more related to heart disease and uh, preventing and reversing heart disease, but it's, it's uh, related to just about everything in human health, including aging, uh, and uh, uh, cutting down on that. Uh, Sandy Kaufman's book, Dr. Sandra Kaufman wrote a book called Kaufman Protocol. Uh, I think that's the most awesome book ever written. Um, <laughs> you know, she's, she's actually uh, a principal investigator on our clinical study right now. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm not saying her book's good because she's a, 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 a principal investigator on clinical study. She's a principal investigator on a clinical study because I read her book and I said, ah, we need her on our study because we're studying aging and I think she's written the most awesome book on that you can find anywhere on the subject. Uh, so, so reducing inflammation, but there's also oxidative stress. Reducing your oxidative stress is really important. Uh, and not just oxidative, but psychological stress, 
which actually induces inflammation and, and, and other kinds of str uh, oxidation, oxidative stress too. You gotta reduce those. Um, <coughs> like a, a good study was uh, uh, caregivers of Alzheimer's patients ended up having shorter telomeres than their friends their same age that didn't have to take care of somebody with Alzheimer's. And so the caregiving caused a lot of stress that causes accelerated telomere shortening and, and you gotta, you can balance it just fine. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna be having to do something like that, I think the patient's gonna be very happy with the fact that you take some time out for yourself too, just to decrease stress. But I could go on and on. In fact, <laughs> you know, my books, I, I've done this and my talks I do this, but there's, there's so much. So decreasing inflammation, decreasing oxidative stress um, are the keys to actually extending your lifespan as long as you can there's so much I do to do that because I just want to make certain I'm still around mm -hmm. when the real cure for aging comes along so that I can benefit from it. Yes, indeed. Well, there's a lot of actionable advice in what you just said, so hopefully uh, the viewers will take at least some of that and apply it in their own lives. Uh, we definitely want as many of us as possible to survive to that time when reversal of telomere shortening becomes possible, as well as repair of other types of age-related damage. Now, you've said before that uh, the cure for aging may be uh, fairly proximate with sufficient funding. And I know at RADFEST, uh, Maria and Trigus Abramson uh, cited you uh, as saying that it might even be possible within a year with enough yes. funding. Well, you know, we are we do have a clinical study underway. Uh, actually, we my company doesn't have it. We created the treatment, and uh, Labella Gene Therapeutics licensed it from us, and they're planning on treating their first patient in November. The treatment that we're doing is something that has reversed aging in engineered mice, uh, and so. I, I'm the first person to say humans aren't mice, so we still have to do it in humans, and we have to do it in a safe way too. But uh, Labella's tr uh, planning on treating their first human in early November, and we don't know, because we're venturing into the unknown, how long it will take to actually see age reversal, if we're gonna see age reversal at all, but I, I think we are. Uh, and uh, it, with the mice, when it was done, I know it took uh, like about three weeks. Well, maybe it might take three months with humans mm -hmm. to actually see it. So before the end of this year, we could possibly see it if, if it happens as fast as it did in mice, or it might be early next year. Or like any clinical study I've ever been on, I've been involved in a lot of them, there's a lot of tweaking that needs to be done. You do a tr patient, you measure, we, we got like 160 different biomarkers we're measuring. Uh, we're doing pre and post uh, and during treatment, so test, before treatment, test during treatment, test after treatment, uh, just to see all the benefits. And we're gonna learn something from these things. And maybe the first few patients, everything won't work, but we will tweak it and make it work. And that's been true of any clinical study that I've ever been in, cancer and heart disease, clinical studies especially. Uh, but uh, I mean, if we get lucky and everything just works as expected the first time, we could see somebody as early as next year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, I'm a scientist and I'm not going to promise anything. I'm not going to guarantee anything. I'm just going to move forward. When we start getting our data and I see that it requires some tweaking, I'm going to work on tweaking that and get this as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of improvements are you hoping to see if the first trial succeeds? Well, everything imaginable. That's, that's what I think telomere shortening has the potential of doing is reversing aging and declining health in every way that you can think of. Um, the mice studies that was done by Dr. Rhonda Pennell uh, at Harvard, uh, he, he was actually a cancer researcher studying to see uh, the effects on cancer, but it actually reduced cancer and it actually, he, he, he stated on the news, it was a remarkable reversal of the aging process. He saw these mice could breed again, memories came back, uh, their their appearance got better, their athleticism got better. Uh, it's it's uh, just about every way imaginable. I, I actually, I'm not a big believer in uh, a lot of biomarkers of 
aging <clears throat> because we, we all know what aging is. You can just look at somebody. I, I, you know, I, I like to show pictures of Betty White uh, at 95 and 25, and I'll, I'll say something like, is there anybody here that doesn't know which photo of Betty White was taken first? Uh, uh, usually gets a laugh, but the fact is, is that nobody in the audience doesn't know. It, you, they can see just looking at those photos, and I say, you know, I, I can't really put my finger on it, but there's something there about the, between these pictures that tells me that uh, Betty White at 25 is younger than that, that was that photo was taken first before the other photo. So I believe we don't really need the biomarkers, but that's what I think we really need is we need to be able to do something that can reverse aging in every way imaginable, and I think telomere lengthening is one of the things that could do it or at least be part of it. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee there's no way anybody's ever going to do it without lengthening telomeres because the data is absolutely infallible right now that, that telomere lung, uh, shortening does cause aging, but it, it doesn't mean it's not the only thing that causes aging. So we have to definitely reverse uh, telomere shortening in order to cure aging. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned during your presentation some species experience telomere shortening and others do not. So humans, dogs, and cats experience it. Mice do not. Well, yeah. I, actually, a study out of University of Texas Southwestern mm -hmm. <coughs> looked at a, a lot of animals, uh, looked at their telomerase levels and looked at their telomere lengths and the rate of their telomere shortening. And it, it was kind of surprising to me that the results came back that the only animals they could find that aged by telomere shortening were dogs, cats, horses, sheep, pig, and deer, and other primates, non-human primates. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I didn't expect it to be that few. And I, what really shocked me was that at least half of those animals are, are domesticated animals. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes me think, did we actually create this? In? One of the things that they didn't do in that study, which I wish they did, they didn't go and take a wild wolf Okay, and look at them. But that would be really interesting if the wild wolf does have telomeres in other cells and don't have telomere shortening, whereas the domesticated animals do. Because that would say that, that telomere shortening is a recent evolutionary event, maybe even in humans too. Um, but other primates have it as well, well, and some of those live in the wild. So some of the primates, so yeah, so well, that's right. So. Some of the primates, we, we, we don't know. It, it, so we mm -hmm. might find out that even the primates the, in the wild do have uh, telomeres producing all their cells. But if, the, if they don't, then they're going to be great subjects to actually start doing some research on. But on the other side of the coin, <coughs> they found in this paper from UT Southwestern, uh, there was a lot of animals that have telomeres producing all their cells. Mm -hmm. And they have no telomere shortening, and they also get they rarely get cancer and other mm -hmm. diseases, which is kind of like counterintuitive according to some people. I, though I've always kind of expected that to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and these animals include like lobsters, mm -hmm. tortoises, um, humpback whales, some birds, some fish, clams. Um, most of these animals, the only way to know how old they live is to be there when they're born and keep them in a cage or aquarium because they don't have something equivalent to rings on a tr and you find in a tree to count. But clams do. Clams mm -hmm. have these rings or these stripes that form every year and people started counting these stripes and they found that some of these clams now live to be 500 plus years mm -hmm. old and they have telomeres in all their cells, they have no telomere shortening, they rarely have any other kind of disease. So, so uh, that's pretty exciting. The same thing was done with Carbon, uh, carbon dating materials in the eyeballs of sharks mm -hmm. and finding sharks sometimes live over 500 years. Well, that's what I want us to do. <laughs> I want us to benefit just like these animals are. And, uh, and if they can do it, we can do it. And mm -hmm. also it's another reason why I call aging a disease. If these other animals don't have it and we do, shoot, it's something we got to cure ourselves of. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And actually, my children's book, Death is Wrong, yeah. lists some uh, exceptionally long-lived animals uh, as well as some plants uh, like the great bristlecone pine tree. And it does raise the question, which was also a question that I had asked myself as a child, if these life forms are capable of such extreme longevity by comparison with humans, then why not humans? 
there doesn't seem to be any insurmountable law of nature that would prevent humans from entering that same category of negligible senescence. Yeah, I hope we can learn something from things like bristlecone pines and stuff. But I am a little bothered by the fact that usually when you find a bristlecone pine that's still alive, it's like one branch. Hmm. The rest of it is dead. Okay, it's like if I got my one finger to, to <laughs> live longer, but the rest of me died, I don't think I would call that success. <laughs> but, but, but we might learn something from bristlecone mm -hmm. pines as to what the, how that all happens. But, you know, um, what I want to do is I want to talk about it's not just life extension, mm -hmm. okay? It's, it's life enhancement too, mm -hmm. okay? And this is what you're really focused on. So I, that's why I like working with you because I'm, I, I don't want to just see life get extended. I want to see life get enhanced too. Uh, and so uh, can you kind of go over what are the major things that we're going to see soon? Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a lot of things that I talk to people about and I keep saying, oh, they got to talk to Gennady. So what, what do you see coming up soon for enhancing our lifespan? And which do you think is going to first? Are we going to extend life first and then enhance it? Or are we going to enhance life first and then extend it? You know, it's like well, if you think about what technology has enabled us to do already, I would say there's a great deal of life enhancement that is available to us today. Yeah. If you consider we are having this conversation recorded on a mobile phone, which has superior capabilities to a lot of professional camcorders that might have existed 10, 20 years ago. And the same device mm. enables people to communicate instantaneously across the world. Exactly. That's and it was amazing uh, 10 years ago uh, to think that this device would have such a transformative impact because these kinds of smartphones were just beginning to come out. Uh, but in terms of future life enhancement, automation can bring about a great deal of convenience by saving us from having to do arduous manual labor uh, just to be able to survive day to day. Uh, already to a great extent we're beneficiaries of automation and production. What about automation in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, say sophisticated cleaning robots? Yeah. Well, that, there's where Ben Gertzel and, mm -hmm. and a lot of other people, and especially the Asian countries, are doing coming forward with a lot of great stuff that's going to really enhance our lives by having <laughs> somebody else do the work, a, mm -hmm. a robot do the work. But you know, you were talking about how we actually do have a lot of enhancements already, and and you know. People are so, some people seem like, like they're afraid of transhumanism, but we're already getting teeth, new teeth installed in our mouths, where pe women are getting breast implants. Those are transhumanist things. It's like th they're, they're enhancing their lives by doing something mm -hmm. artificial to their body that their body didn't do, that it, it evolution didn't make it that way. And it's like the teeth, uh, even eyeglasses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Eyeglasses, I think, are a form of transhumanism. I mean, ma imagine how did, we, how did we survive before eyeglasses when predators were chasing us or we had to go chase some others as when we became the predators to chase, chase food. It's, uh, uh, when eyes went bad, that was a death sentence. Right. Now it's not anymore. Yes. Uh, yeah, transhumanism has been going on for quite some time. Yes, uh, life expectancy was, of course, miserably short during the Middle Ages, and eyeglasses were first developed around the 13th century. Interestingly enough, just two centuries later, the Renaissance yeah. took place. <coughs> so uh, there is a bit of a connection between uh, the advances of these technologies and also flourishing in culture, which in turn also fueled further technological growth. So there's a symbiosis among all of these areas. And dental hygiene is another example where convenience has improved greatly. In the 19th century, when people would go to their dentist, at the time it would have been their barber. And the barbers, in addition to cutting hair, would pull teeth 
and whenever somebody suffered from tooth decay, uh, their teeth would just get pulled and it was tremendously painful. Anesthesia was just beginning to come into use at the time and many people suffered horribly from what today would be a routine preventable or treatable ailment. Yeah, when you, when you talk about that category, there's so many things come to mind now that where, where transhumanism has been going on for hundreds of years practically, where we, it's like, how did we used to live? How could we put up with all this pain, amputations without anesthetics, uh, anesthesia? It, it was like uh, awful, but you know what? I, I, I really want to ask you about so one of the most exciting things I th think is going to come out of the transhumanist movement is, uh, and, and Terry Grossman talked about this in The Immortalist, uh, him and Ray Kurzweil talked about this in their book Transcend, uh, but it's, a lot of other people have talked about it too, and it's been going around, but the idea of nanobots, mm -hmm. okay, I just think all the time, won't it be great when we have nanobots that are walking up and down our blood vessels and cleaning out all the plaque? Yes. I mean, boy, think of how life is gonna change when that happens. The, the death, you know, people dying from heart disease will just decrease immensely. And, uh, uh, but same with cancer and other mm -hmm. things. Nanobots can get in there and start finding. So what is, what do you see? How, how long is it gonna be before nanobots become actual reality? I would estimate about 20 to 30 years mm -hmm. if that long, darn. current uh, rates of progress with miniaturization and nanotechnology continue. Now, there are already some applications of nanotechnology today. Uh, for instance, nanoparticles could be used to deliver targeted doses of chemotherapy drugs. Mm. Now, with a nanorobot, that's a more sophisticated design than uh, just configuring a tiny particle to deliver a substance. But uh, I would say it's a great example of the synthesis of biology and technology, where uh, technology at the nanoscale can be used to repair damaged cells even. Yeah. I, I actually think of using nanoparticles for delivering drugs. That's not a new subject, that's an old subject. But when nanobots first started coming about, it became such a buzzword that people started calling this new, new uh, the old type of delivery system uh, uh, nanoparticles. And but that's not really new. That's nothing like what, what mm -hmm. the future has to offer with nanobots. Uh, just to have these little robots that are crawling through and finding things and fixing them. And I, I think that's gonna be such a big revolutionary change and that's what all gonna come out of that transhumanist party. But you said it's gonna take like, I think you said 20 to 30 years. And you know, the only reason it's going to take that long is because of the lack of funding. Mm -hmm. I mean, this the funding is so much needed in all these areas of like transhumanism, mm -hmm. anti-cancer, of course, anti-aging too. And <clears throat> you know, people keep saying how they've discovered a cure for cancer. And then like a lot, a lot of them are charlatans, they're just faking it. But a lot of them really have made major discoveries in cancer and they're making the announcements because they need funding. Mm -hmm. Then they don't get the funding and then everybody wonders, well, why didn't they ever come up with that cure for cancer? And it's like it, everybody, the whole world, they have to participate in this whole effort that you're doing with transhumanism, that can cancer doctors are doing to cure cancer. And, and I, I believe that it's gotta be more than just donating to societies like the Cancer Society, the Heart Disease Society and things like that because those have actually become more commercial organizations where probably 99% of the money never makes it into research and plus I've seen a lot of cases where money from those organizations have gone into research that had nothing to do with cancer or heart disease or transhumanism and stuff like that. So I think people need to start getting more involved with actually keeping on top of what's going on, learning from people like you and me and a lot of cancer doctors. I, I, I'm gonna mention Jason, Dr. Jason Williams is a key example of somebody who's really done some pioneering stuff in research. And he, you, me, we could all be going faster in our research if there was more po uh, 
if we became more popular, right? let's say there was, if the population became more personally interested in our particular type of research, uh, the world's a fantastic place. I, I personally want to make certain I'm still around when this happens, and, and I'm seeing that funding is the big obstacle. It seems mm -hmm. like we all know what to do. It's just not enough funding to get it done. Yes, indeed. I'm thinking of all of the fundraising events that occur for disease-specific research. There are even running races devoted to mm. heart disease research or breast cancer research, and they draw large numbers of participants. So uh, I was thinking, what if we have a race to cure aging? Yeah, no, I, I, I remember you talking about uh, uh, with Aubrey de Grey, you, me, and Aubrey de Grey were talking, and the idea of doing a race to support SINs, mm -hmm. I think, is a key thing to helping aging and, and a lot of other things, because uh, SENS is doing a lot of, a lot of different stuff. Uh, so I would look forward to, in fact, I've already volunteered to help you with that race, uh, organize it, and uh, uh, that should be uh, a really good thing to do. Uh, we'll see what happens out of it. Yes, absolutely. There need to be more efforts to essentially raise publicity, raise awareness that this research is happening. It could be proceeding at a much faster rate, but that does require funding, but also public support, the recognition that these are worthwhile goals, because the more people consider them to be worthwhile goals, the easier it will be for many to justify donating. Aubrey de Grey has sometimes spoken about the sources of reluctance that he typically encounters, and actually he knows a lot of wealthy individuals who are sympathetic toward the goal of reversing the damage of aging, but their family members have reservations, yeah, and their family members might not let them donate. I, I've, I too have heard the wealthy and possible investor saying, he can't invest because his wife doesn't want him to. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, there's all kinds of things, but it's like somehow educating the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think you and I have done a pretty good job of, or the best we can to educate people on actually what's going on to prove that there's real science. It's, it's not all quacks and charlatans anymore. There's some really good science going on. And uh, I, you know, I'm, just don't know how to do it better than we're doing, but I'm hoping mm -hmm. people will come, you know, somebody out there can come up with some way to really help promote uh, everything we're doing. Yes, indeed. Well, I would say it's a gradual process of raising that awareness, like running a marathon or an ultra marathon. One doesn't <coughs> achieve it all instantaneously, but making a little bit of progress at a time causes the remaining task to become a bit easier. So uh, it may feel like a grind at times, but I have noticed some impacts. The Transhumanist Party has grown quite a bit since I became yep. chairman, and now we have a presidential candidate, Yohannan Ben Zion, who's going to essentially use his campaign as a vehicle for educating people on life extension. His campaign slogan is, radical life extension is closer than you think. And he's very much on board with the idea of trying to find some dramatic, impactful ways of raising publicity, raising awareness, reaching new demographics. So I'm hopeful that a lot will come out of this. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. He, he and uh, um, Charlie Cam mm -hmm. uh, teaming up together for the uh, presidential candidate, even if they don't win, mm -hmm. they should help really promote this whole industry of, of life extension and, and life enhancement. Yes, so. and that is the goal. Uh, ultimately, the transhumanist party believes in putting science, health, and technology at the forefront of American politics, but politics is really just an instrumental component to this. It's one arena where we can operate to spread the message because some people pay attention to that arena and not so much to the others. But if the political aspect can serve as a gateway into the science, a gateway into the philosophy, into really understanding how our society might <coughs> be transformed, then 
our task will have been accomplished. Yeah. As you know, I'm not very political. I, it's not that I'm against politics, it's just I'm so busy doing science mm -hmm. and stuff like that that it's hard for me to keep track of what's going on. But I definitely am a true Transhumanist Party member. Yes, indeed. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this, this actually taking off. You know, I, I want to ask you something else. Um, the, the whole idea of like spinal cord repair mm -hmm. and things like that, yes. that's actually showing some exciting results. I've been reading mm -hmm. about people who actually were told they can never walk again, and mm -hmm. they're walking again. That's so, right. So is this still just in the clinical studies, or, or is this now in a place where people can actually, that have spinal cord disorders, can actually go and get treated? I believe right now they would still have to sign up for clinical trials, but the trials are becoming more widespread. Also, functional prosthetics and yeah. exoskeletons. I've seen a lot of those mm -hmm. arms and legs, and I was impressed that I saw a guy just about two weeks ago walking, and below, from the knee down on both legs, were completely artificial. But he looked like he was a normal walking person. Mm -hmm. You would have never suspect. You would have had to look yet closely at his feet and realize that they were like different shaped feet, but the guy walked around just like uh, anybody else. And I'm just so impressed that we can do that nowadays. And that's all part of the transhumanist mm -hmm. movement. Yes, indeed. There have even been runners with yeah. artificial feet <laughs> competing and, and winning beating prizes. All of us. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> beating all of us that don't have artificial feet. Um, and uh, soon that's going to be a category all in itself. Mm -hmm. Um, Speaking of which, Zoltan Istvan, uh, who founded the Transhumanist yes. Party, has been proposing the idea of a Transhumanist Olympics, where unlike in the current Olympics, uh, where people aren't allowed to use any kinds of enhancements, people would be allowed to use anything uh, as long as uh, it's not terribly harmful, I suppose, but anything that enhances their athletic performance could be deployed and then uh, this would be a different category of sport, but uh, people might be interested to see what is the human body capable of with these augmentations. I think it's going to be very exciting now, to, to watch these events, but Zoltan is amazing. He, mm -hmm. he's, he's still working with you guys. He's still involved in the Transhumanist Party, is that correct? Well, he occasionally gives us advice. Mostly he's off uh, on his various speaking tours and writing articles. So he's very much uh, still involved in journalism. Uh, he started out as a journalist and now he has become a well-established opinion writer on subjects of transhumanism and technology and how technology would transform the future. So I think that's occupying a lot of his time. This is why he decided to hand over the political aspect to the current leadership of the Transhumanist Party. But certainly he wants to see the Transhumanist Party flourish and he wants to see it greatly expand its reach. Well, I think he's done a great job of getting it to where it was when, when you took over. I did a book review, review on my YouTube channel of Dr. Neil Reardon's uh, book. It's yes. called Stem Cells A Rising Tide. In that book, there's a chapter about spinal cord. And mm -hmm. according to Neil Reardon and his, U, um, his stem cell institute in Panama that he has, they have taken people who were quadriplegics with mesenchymal umbilical cord derived stem cell injections from C-section of healthy births and they're walking now. You guys were also talking more about transhumanism as kind of like the electronic, electronics and prosthetics is kind of what you were mm -hmm. focusing on. But um, from my research, that's pretty well documented. And when I say research, I try and find names. I try and mm -hmm. find these people on Facebook. I send them a Facebook message. I find them on LinkedIn, cross-reference. I make sure that, to the best I can that these people, like an investigative journalist type approach. Mm -hmm. And um, from what I found, these people are real, and it's really happened. There's documentation of them not being able to walk for many years, mm -hmm. and then from their clinic. And, you know, uh, <coughs> Bill Gibson's da dad is mm -hmm. like 100 now. He's still alive, and he went there when he was 92. Mm -hmm. Well, and look at what Liz Parrish did. Yes. I mean, right? sh showing that those, 
videos as a kid, could barely walk upstairs. Then he's walking upstairs fine. Incredible. I mean, it's like uh, it's like we are in a very exciting time. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, it's uh, it's just I just can't wait to see what's going to happen next. Bill, uh, speaking of regenerating lost capabilities, what are some of your thoughts about the potential of stem cell treatments to heal injuries? Well, I think the whole stem cell industry is fascinating. I, I, think, I think other things are going to come along that, that are going to probably replace them, but there, there are ways away, but uh, I, I, I'm just impressed with the kind of things that stem cells are doing. And, you know, I, I've, I've become friends with a lot of the top leaders in uh, stem cell research, and I'm just super amazed at a lot of the stuff that's going on. Unfortunately, all these people that are really the top leaders in the field have to go outside the United States to treat their mm -hmm. patients, but these patients are just amazing. Um, you know, uh, some of these doctors are working out of Mexico, Panama, uh, uh, Colombia. Uh, but uh, especially if you're like in Florida or something like that, it's an easy trip to go there to get treated and then come back for all the testing and et cetera. But I have heard amazing stories of and seen. I've talked to patients that that, for instance, had heart attacks. Okay, and they're they're what's called ejection fraction. That's the ability to move blood out of your heart into into the uh, all the vessels running through your body. It's like what percentage of the uh, blood actually gets pumped out every time the heart pumps. And it's supposed to be something like 60, 65 percent normally. But uh, people's hearts would get damaged during heart attacks and their ejection fraction would drop to 15 percent, which is you can't even get out of bed with, mm -hmm. that, with that little bit of pumping because your, your limbs and stuff like that just aren't getting enough oxygen. I have heard about people getting stem cells. In this particular case, I'm thinking it was mesenchymal stem cells uh, injected into like different like legs and arms and stuff like that. And the stem cells would go everywhere in the body, but their ejection fractions get up to like 50%. Uh, just as a result of the stem cells getting in there and inducing what was originally thought damage to the heart that can never be fixed, but these hearts are getting fixed. And, and then the, the people walking again, with having stem cell injections into their uh, nervous system, their backs and their spinal cord, uh, it, it, it's amazing what I'm hearing from, from all these different doctors. Um, and unfortunately, like every great science, there's a lot of charlatans in the field too. So I think anybody who is thinking about getting stem cell treatment really need to investigate. And you know, I. I I'm going to sound like I'm repeating a record, or rep, uh, repeating myself because I've said this in so many talks before. It's very important to go to some like database of scientific peer-reviewed journals. Uh, uh, a good example of that is PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and just read all the papers. Do what's called a meta-analysis because even though it's a database of scientific peer-reviewed journals, some poor journals, some, some, some articles, research articles get published that shouldn't be. So read a bunch of them and then find out, you know, if 90% of them are saying one, 10% are saying the other, go with those 10%. Look to see who are these authors. Contact them. They're the ones that are going to tell you where to go to get the legitimate treatments and not by the charlatans. Uh, unfortunately, <coughs> a lot of the charlatans look at those 10% or 1% of the papers that say the opposite. And they use that all as information is to promote themselves. And that's, that's why it's, there's so much misinformation. That's why so much uh, what people hear about ways of treating diseases and stuff like that is all hearsay and not true at all. Uh, so meta-analysis meta of scientific peer-reviewed studies is really the best way to start a search for the best way to actually get treated for any kind of disease or ailment that a person has. Yes, and that's great advice. I think anyone who is interested in a longer, healthier life needs to also exercise a certain degree of skepticism to avoid pitfalls and avoid pseudoscience, essentially. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of stuff is coming up. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, <coughs> how, how do I put it, uh, like 
extended and enhanced life, mm -hmm. or extending enhanced life, or uh, uh, enhancing extended life. Uh, it's all this kind of stuff is is just happening right around the corner, and I'm glad you and I are right in the middle of all this right now. So yes. it's going to be exciting. Likewise, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this evening and interacting with you over the past three years. I hope that as we continue our efforts, we're going to see more and more reward in terms of solving some of the greatest problems of our time. Yeah, and I can't wait for you to come up with something so that I can beat you in one of the races. <laughs> <laughs> it's, always been, it's always been great meeting with you. I've never... We've never gotten together and didn't have a really powerful, intellectual, exciting discussion about something like this. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you. One mind. One love. One heart. One soul. In the skies, hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. Are you gonna drop the bomb or no? Let us die young or let us live forever. We don't have the power, but we never say never. Sitting in a sand pit, life is a short trip. The music's for the sad men. Getting in tune, the music's played by the the madman.